Hi, I'm Adam Spencer and welcome to Day One, the podcast that spotlights Australian startups, founders, and the organizations that empower Australian entrepreneurship. We go back to the beginning to tell the story of Australia's most inspiring founders and how they built their companies. You're listening to a special interview series as part of a documentary W2D1 is producing about the history of the Australian startup ecosystem. On the episode today, we have... Hi, I'm Rick Richardson, serial inventor and uh, fairly well known for the guy that won a big court case against Microsoft for patent infringement back in the early 2010s. So can you give us a little elevator pitch about what you're up to at the moment? I've actually got three fairly heavy projects on at the moment. One is just the most recent thing is Wallet Nation, which I'm doing with uh, Angela Clark, ex-VP uh, from CBA. Mm-hmm. I've also got a project called Deadbolt, which we're really struggling to find a CEO for, but I, it looks like I'm partnering up with a uh, VC who is, you know, wants to take over management for the project, and that is working out how to curb ransomware, which is pretty heavy. And uh, Haven Tech, which is my baby, started with uh, with uh, Tony Castagna. And uh, that is getting rid of passwords for logging on the sites. You know, want to make passwords a thing of the past. You're familiar with a guy named Derek Sivers? Yeah, yeah. I liked his first book. He's kind of a very free spirit. The fact that he's in New Zealand now, I just think that's really, uh, he's willing to travel and uh, expose himself to new things and, you know, hats off to him. And also he's uh, really entrepreneurial. So I I just found it really interesting what he did with his um, CD Baby project yes and i'm always looking for interesting opportunities like that tim ferris you know all of those characters I just find it really interesting to pick up what little things i can to um try and roll them into any of the projects that i do and that's the unusual thing about my situation in that being an inventor i'm just going from problem to problem and then uh, doing what I can to support the businesses that roll out from those inventions, but I don't have the uh, long concentrated focus that you know a normal entrepreneur does. You know, in staying with a business for five to ten years, I've done that once, and I found myself being really quite not not good at it. <laughs> so, uh... is there anything two ways? One, one way is there anything that from your you know, inventing that you've taken out of that that helped you run a company and, and vice versa? Is there anything that running a company helped you be a better inventor? Um, the, the problem is that one of the most important things for inventors is to be self-aware. And to, to illustrate the point is that it actually reminds me of a time that um, Pete Cooper uh, got me to speak to some kids at the at Sidstart, and he told everyone in the audience, there was about 300 in the audience, that I was going to do a room just to talk to people who were at the early stages who want to talk to um, people who were really technology-driven and want to make sure that at the early stages they do everything they need to do to make sure they're successful. And when I got them in the room, there was 70 with standing room only, which is... I was really surprised that such a high percentage of the audience wanted to know what what I was going to go on about. (laughs) The first thing I did is I asked them, how many of you are CEOs of your own company? And like the majority of them put their hand up. And I said, and how, how many of you have actually been in business for more than a year? And a large percentage put their hand up. And then I said, so if you were the chairman of the board of your company and you can pick any CEO that you wanted, uh, would you pick yourself? And there was like three hands. <laughs> and that illustrated my point is that people who solve problems are different to the people who run a business that solves the problem. And so I, uh, I talk a lot about people really working out the difference between loving the idea of solving a problem and the idea of running a business that solves the problem. And they're two separate things. 
you know, and so like I usually, uh, you know, I've, I've been lucky to uh, be able to solve some significant problems and actually get business partners who, you know, testify to the fact that the problems that I've solved are, of you know, good significance, worthwhile significance. But when it comes to actually running a business, I find that the qualities that make you really good as an inventor or as a problem solver actually make you bad as a CEO, as a business person. They, there's just uh, a parting of the ways in, in the qualities, like, you know, building a team and uh, working at how to refine the team and managing people that you take on and then you have to pivot and then you have to either find uh, retrain them or find another opportunity for them or tell them that you can't look after them anymore. Those kind of things are too much for me. I just... I, whenever I hire somebody, <laughs> I basically take responsibility for their their career. And um, in fact, I've only ever had to fire three people in my life, and one of them was out outright. You know, they were abusing the company, and there's no question when somebody does really something wrong. But the other two, I actually found another business that was after them, uh, and paid their first two months of uh, salaries uh, and, you know, let them be scalped because I didn't want to, you know, fire them. And, you know, one of them actually tracked me down some years later and, you know, realized what I'd done. And uh, I just said, I just, I felt so terrible. The company pivots. And if the person's skills don't fit what happened in the company, then, you know, you're caught in this terrible situation. So, all of that, working out marketing, working out customer plans, you know, all the things that happen after you've solved the problem are not my space. Although so often the company will head along on its merry way and then run into either a shift in technology or a new opportunity and they really need me to come in and, um, you know, move with it. So um, that gives me an excuse to be curious about anything in a given field and spend lots of time researching and looking at where things are moving, how they're moving, and how to uh, improve. My mantra is the best person to know how to uh, to do the next best thing is to somebody who did the last thing but is self-aware enough to know how to, to blow it up and replace it with something better which no one likes to hear about because everybody's invested quite heavily in the first thing, that technology moves lightning fast. I, th- I would imagine every single kid out there at some point thought they were going to grow up and be an inventor. I know I did. <laughs> you know, how did you keep that, you know, curiosity for the world? It, it's an interesting thing about Australians and it took me a long time to realise it. In fact, I, it wasn't until I was in my 40s that I really understood what was going on because I've always been an inventor, but I didn't. I thought everybody invented. You know how if you if you find something really easy to do, you just assume everybody can do it. Like for example, you know, in guitar, I can play pretty much anything Dave Gilmore can play, but Joe Satriani, give me a break, and Jimi Hendrix. I just, I'm just a write-off. I just can't get his, you know, his loosey-goosey feel. So you just have natural abilities. And when it came to inventing, I just thought everybody solved problems. And I didn't even think of it twice. And it was only when um, I invented uh, the Unilock technology, which was software activation, that people made a big deal out of it. And it turned into a big project. And I thought that I'd accidentally done my Mona Lisa. And that was the one thing that I was ever going to do of significance. So I had that big gutsy decision to make is, um, you know, am I going to stick my neck out and think that no one else has done this and get a patent? You know, no one else in the world has done this and get a patent. Or am I going to look back in 10 years and wonder what would have happened if I had have got on and, you know, sucked it up and became a, uh, you know, a serious inventor and got the technology going. And it was only much later in my 40s that I realized that 
um, Australians have a problem in that we all tend to think of uh, each other as similarly gifted we tend not to want to stick out from the crowd, you know, the tall poppy syndrome, but that's actually a good thing because it makes Australians think, you know, egalitarianly of each other. And and I find that, um, I find that refreshing. You know, when my wife and I got home from living in the States for 10 years, that's one of the great things about being home is that everybody thinks of each other as generally, you know, another Aussie, and knows no errors and graces, and of course you run into people that are that think they're God's gift. But um, most most Aussies have got a pretty good self evaluation, and and you just find that refreshing. You know, once you've travelled around the world, you see people that are climbing over themselves to in socially or uh, financially, and um, it's. You know, Byron Bay, that's what I love about living here is the richest guy is still in shorts and T-shirt <laughs> and, and the homeless guy's in the shorts and T-shirt. You can't really tell the difference, you know. <laughs> it's really good. <laughs> Back in 92, when you started Unilock, am I, am I right with that timeline? 92. Um, you know, the startup support that exists today obviously did not exist then. What What did you... Like who did, how, how did you get started who, at that time? Like who did you lean on? Who was there to help you, th- you know, figure it all out? I had a pretty good run. I had a very dear friend, Jim Revitt, who was the um, correspondent, television correspondent for uh, ABC Television for Vietnam. And he was a tremendous mentor for me and helped me get some news stories going and that found some people who came in to support financially uh my parents they didn't even really understand what a patent was but they invested the the first big chunk of money for me to be able to do patents and patents were a lot more expensive back then than they are now even though they're still very expensive you know you you can spend 35 to 200 grand per patent for in, for international rights you know, and that's just for one country, right? So it can get quite expensive. But the problem is that if you really are an inventor and you're self-aware, you know that the chances of you moving fast enough as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, is so low that you have to have some kind of insurance that makes sure that if somebody just takes your idea and runs with it, that uh, you've been seen to do the right thing by the people who love you, the people that, you know, uh, support you and uh, the people who've invested in the project, you know, you you really have a responsibility to do that. And uh, it turned out that, uh, you know, nearly a decade later, over a decade later, that investment was was worthwhile. It's not, doesn't pay out for a lot of people, but um, I just think it's irresponsible to uh, to not have a patent, uh, you know, I have this expression that not having a patent is like having a Lamborghini and leaving the keys in it. You know, it, it's just irresponsible. Mm, yeah. How many inventions would you say you had come up with prior to the activation technology? Um, I was pretty regular at it. It's just I'd call it problem solving, but the difference between my kind of problem solving and a normal person's problem solving is, you know, how far apart the dots are that you connect, you know, to solve the problem. And I've always had a knack for being able to, you know, join dots that are not really easily uh, connected. So, you know, even as a kid, I was exploring bike designs that were more like a motorbike, straight tubing you know, when the Mongoose BMX bike came out, I was so disappointed because I thought someone had stolen my idea, <laughs> you know, and using motorbike handlebars instead of dragster handlebars and, you know, all that kind of thing. And just what you think is needed to solve the problem, especially if you're doing jumps and stuff like that, it's different to a dragster. There's just there's something very uncool about, you know, jumping off a mound of dirt with a dragster. 
Malvern Star Dragster. But, um, you know, and also getting into motorbikes and stuff like that, you could just see straight away that BMX bikes were that, you know, that's the direction. And then also um, different designs of skateboards, skating with parallel as if you're skiing because my family were skiers. So that's like I'm talking like 13 years of age, really young. I'm the, you know, those, those kind of things were quite young, but, you know, I thought everybody tinkered with, uh, you know, their ideas. And then, uh, later on in the music industry, I was the first guy to connect a Macintosh to a Fairlight and to get it to automate the Fairlight's loading, which Fairlight's is a famous music computer. And I became fairly well known as the guy who, um, could get a Fairlight to, jump through hoops and you know got to write in electronic musician magazine and you know all these different get to talk to all these great musos and uh, it was my excuse if I wasn't the top musician in Australia I could be you know one of the rare computer music literate musicians in Australia and that you know enabled me to meet all kinds of interesting people like you know Chris Carroll as Michael Jackson's Synclavier operator and he and I became friends. I got exposed to a real lot of interesting people, but at the heart of it, it was just that ability to tinker and to, um, you know, solve problems that other people don't see. And then eventually I moved into solving a problem that was of such significance that it meant that I dropped everything else and just focused on it. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I asked how many other inventions you had come up with. Because I'm, you know, the activation technology, that was the first patent, right? That you'd ever yeah. applied for. How did you know, like, big risk? You said it does, it costed a lot of money to do that. The, the patent. Yes. Yeah. How did you know that you, you wanted to go down that road? Well, I remember sitting out the front of a party in Little Narrabeen and sitting in the gutter because I was just couldn't relate to everybody at the party because I knew that the problem I'd just solved was of really great significance. And I'd read a book by uh, Jim Fitzsimons talking about the three different ways that you protect an idea, copyright, trade secret, and uh, patent. And it was such a big decision because it's so un-Australian to uh, – to think you're the only guy in the world who's done something like that and that now you're going to go and get someone to write a piece of paper that proves it and then getting a government to give you a stamp of approval that says, you know, that uh, you claim this for the next 20 years. So it was a real big deal in my head to do that. In reality, the moment that I'd actually solved the problem, which was how to lock software to a particular uh, Mac computer, and enable that software to move from machine to machine and realize that it's on a new computer each time by doing a fingerprint of the internal components of each Mac, it was something that was really commercially important. And it was a new way of distributing software. It predated the internet because back then it was all floppy disks and people just sharing floppy disks with apps on them. So, and it was just, and it was particularly interesting to me because at that time, I'd got rights to some music software called uh, One Step and had the, had the Australian rights to the source code and wanted to get into distribution. And uh, Apple stores wouldn't you know, stock it because it wasn't a, a field that was really growing at that time, the music field. So I needed to find a way to allow music, musicians to do what they love doing, which is copying software and saying hey this really is interesting this should really work and you know letting it just um travel by itself and then at some stage work out how to um you know to get paid for it which you know is time bombing that's that's really the first uh way that the technology worked which was time bombing or crippleware where you can use the software as much as you want but you can't you know save your files so um, both of those things were dependent on this uh, machine locking technology, which I patented. And it basically 
took off with Uncle Jim's support, you know, a bit of notoriety, dad helping me with the patent. And then IBM Australia picked up on what I was doing and had me flown to uh, Boulder, Colorado. And within three days of us meeting, um, they had an offer to do worldwide marketing for the technology with a $500,000 advance. Wow. That was like, that doesn't happen this that often these days. But I'll tell you what, the, the other thing was that software was working by then. So, you know, I'd only spent about uh, $30,000, 40, about $40,000 on patenting and about $30,000 on engineering by that time. But they were just so impressed that they just picked us up straight away. And that got us started for the, uh, for the next four years until I ended up going to the States. What year was that that you got involved with IBM? Uh, that was 93. It was within, you know, three or four months of me inventing the thing. Yeah, that's amazing. So, so you you invented this technology. You spent seventy thousand dollars getting it up and running, including patents. You know, IBM hears about you, or did you approach them? A very dear family friend was on the uh, young young achievers committee, and I'd been looking around for someone for some adult supervision for me for my business and uh, he was considering coming in and he was on the board of the Young Achievers Awards with the GM for IBM Australia and just so happened that IBM was trying to do a a software unlockable technology for CDs which no one had knew about. IBM was in the middle very early stages of uh, developing CD technology and uh, they'd spent $35 million at that time and when they heard what I was up to and I was doing with floppy disks they they wanted to see it working and then went out to Cumberland Forest and uh, the GM was uh, Ravi Mawaha a really really nice a real gentleman Um, he became a mentor and uh, got me to explain to his technical team what what I was doing the fact that we were patented and that the code was working, they were just just a bit mind-bending for them because they're used to people coming in with half-cocked ideas. They're not used to people walking in with something working. Then I got connected to IBM Boulder, which was the the guys who handled software manufacturing for the whole of the the United uh, the whole of the uh, whole of the company, and. Uh, Met the VP in charge of the area and, uh, you know, in, in charge of software manufacturing. And three days later, we had a had a deal. But, uh, you know, that, that was a fantastic story because no one had warned him that we were so well along on, on the process of actually having the thing working. And we actually had the unlocking center that supplied the unlock codes for the software running out of a... Uh, MasterCard Center in Auburn, which was very expensive, but um, it meant that we could do unlocking a software 24 hours a day with a phone call. So I'm in this VP's office and he unlocks a piece of software on his desktop. So he has a, a Macintosh on his desktop. He gets the music software, he installs it, he runs the uh, runs the try and buy screen puts his credit card details, everything, says, now what? He says, you've got to ring this number. So it, he had to ring a number in Australia. And he was shocked because he thought it would be a demo. He thought I'd just give him an unlock code. And I said, no, no, this is this is actually, you're ringing at the MasterCard Center in Australia. And he says, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. And I go, yep, it's 24 hours. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty good fun to see his face. <laughs> and he goes, this is working. This isn't a demo. This is working. I said, oh, well, I'm demonstrating it, but it is actually real. <laughs> you are ringing up a place. And then he, he rings it up and he gets an unlock code. Then he gets to, comes to the next Mac. I think they were the only two Macs in the whole of the facility at Boulder. And, um, and puts the same details in and the unlock code doesn't work. And then he rings up and gets another <laughs> unlock code. And I said, I just made 70 bucks. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he was just so shocked. And he just told all the guys in the room, there was about 10 guys in the room standing there just looking at these two Macs. And he said, get everybody 
down here. We're going to the conference room. Wow. And the guy who was looking after us stayed with us in, in his room. And I said, what just happened? Am I in trouble? And he said, no, they didn't realize that this was actually working. Hmm. They didn't realize that you'd, you'd actually solved the problem because they spent $35 million and they're only about 25% of the way towards what you're doing. Wow. <laughs> and he said, Rick, you just knocked it out of the park. And I went, oh, great. Well, I hope it works. <laughs> 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 so it was, it, was, uh, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. So obviously, ninety two, ninety three in Australia, the, the you know the startup ecosystem, you know startup support, all the stuff that exists today, you know, did not exist then. No. Going over to the US, was there anything that shocked you about the difference between the business kind of landscape between Australia and the US? Well, I, the only reason I had to go there was that all of our customers were all in the states. IBM had developed relationships in the states. They had moved uh, all their software manufacturing into Lotus and Lotus basically stopped doing software manufacturing and just focused on, on their own products. So I could see support for us dwindling and if I didn't do something, I'm, I was confronted with uh, possibly going bankrupt, you know, the company not surviving it. So I had to go to the States and uh, things just happen on a scale there that, um, it's very hard to for an Australian to comprehend. Things move so much faster and there's so much support. You know, Americans are so good at um, getting in behind an interesting idea. It certainly is the place to be if you, uh, you know, really want to, you know, hard charge. But the, the, the ad advantage of Australia is that it's conservatism and it's it's risk averseness actually means that you do a lot of due diligence and you actually are a lot more careful. And so I'd say that the quality of the projects here are, are generally really high. The ability to scam here is so much harder and people take the responsibility a lot, a lot more. There's a lot of fast talkers. Like one of the big advantages as an Aussie, it's a disadvantage and, a, and an advantage in that when I made promises, they were usually round about 80% of what I knew I could deliver. Just because I felt the responsibility, you know, having started the business with my parents and with IBM, they actually just loaned me the money. They weren't my business partners or anything. But the fact that I felt that much responsibility early, I had not experience what it's like to have big money thrown at you and have more money than cents, you know, in a business. But, you know, when I got to the States, it, it was also just before the 2000 bubble too. So it was really, I felt really uh, a lot of pressure not to uh, abuse the situation. And you could see people left, right and center setting up, you know, dial up internet companies. There was all kinds of uh, shenanigans going on and so many interesting opportunities to get involved with. That's, that's the other thing is that so much is happening there that it's very hard to uh, stick to your knitting. You know, Australia, that's part of the reason why I'm in Byron Bay is also that I get to visit Sydney from time to time. And when I go down there, it's always packed with people to visit and people to see. But you do get an opportunity to to clear your head and really think things out when you're away from it all and it's even worse in LA like um when i first became went back to being a full-time inventor in 2007 my business partner craig etchigoyen would still get me sometimes monday and wednesday for lunch and it would always be some business deal some person come to us with some idea to uh, you know to peruse, and it's so interesting and it's so easy to get sucked up into interesting projects, but you get your eye off the ball because if you really want to put a dent in the universe, you've got to really do a lot of focused thinking. I, I know what it's like to tinker around with small to medium size inventions, and I know what it's like to have an invention be used on two and a half billion machines. You know. Like uh, software activation is used pretty pervasively, and uh, 
you know, I'd love to, once I learned how to do that, I'd love to, you know, do it multiple times because that's, a, that's as an inventor, it's seeing people use your, use your idea is um, a tr- wonderful privilege. How does it make you feel that to have that big of an impact on the world? It's funny, you know, like it's interesting inventing for the first, you know, few months when you're solving a problem, you're usually solving it for yourself or you're solving it for a group of people that you care about and then you see the potential for the thing to go much bigger. And then your responsibility is only to to see the idea not die on the vine, you know, to see it used as much as possible. But, you know, when it gets really used on a large scale like, um, you know, what uh, Microsoft has done with software activation, it's really satisfying. But, you know, at the same time that while the initial seed was my idea and the patent gave me that recognition of being the guy who did that, um, you know that there's millions of hours of effort from other people who have just seen the the value in what's what you've done and you know made it made it palatable for people to use but you know for me the fact that it um is responsible for 26 percent of microsoft sales you know software activation at the time was responsible for 26 percent of that microsoft sales and you know that's that's really uh, uh that's really si- significant but you know, like the next project, Haven Tech, I designed it for my parents so that they could use a four-digit PIN and not a password, and that their passwords, that nothing needed to be stored on the server side. It's an interesting concept, what I built for uh, for them, actually, and my friend Tony Castagna is the uh, co-founder, business co-founder on that. And, uh, you know, we haven't broken the back of that there's some banks and some big enterprises are using it. So I know that it's working and that people are benefiting from it. But until, you know, it's used uh, pervasively, I wouldn't say that that project's finished, you know. So, um, you know, there's always what's next, what you haven't done. And um, that's my life much more than sitting around looking at, you know, past past achievements, although it does give you confidence especially when you're looking at a problem that uh, confounds you. Like, to give you an idea, the hardest invention I've ever had to fix is um, uh, white sharks, you know, trying to work out how to detect them and protect people from white sharks, right? The the local mayor here in uh, Byron Bay asked me to fix it. And I thought, how hard can it be? And it is so hard because there's nothing known about the the darn things there's so many people that have an opinion about whatever you're going to do just it's just a technical nightmare and although i think we have broken the back of that problem and it's like limited in this in its uh, financial scope and return possibilities it still is one of the most irritating problems i've ever had to solve you know give me a quantum computer or something else like that that's much more fun <laughs> You know, <laughs> what's your process when when someone comes to you with this problem? Like, how do you attack it? Um, most of my problems are me trying to fix things myself. Although with the shark problem, that was just seeing Simon Richardson, his first six months of being the mayor here, and just his total dejection over having just had a a gentleman lose his life you know, on one of our favorite beaches and thinking, why haven't we solved that problem? What is the problem? Why can't sonar pick up uh, sharks? Why can't we see in the water? Why can't we detect them from the beach? How can you see through the surf, you know, the aerated water of the surf? And so you just start to ask a series of questions and find out what other people have done to try and solve the problem or just look at what technologies are available to solve it. So it ends up that I went through about four different technologies at quite expense before I ran into the last one. 
which was just a bastardization of of a technique that's already being used and it's quite popular, which is using green lidar to uh, do the equivalent of a topographic map of uh, of the seabed. It just so happens that you can also pick up anything else else that's in the water. So, um, and it's it's incredibly powerful, but just no one had ever thought of using the gear that we use to measure how much coral has moved to uh to see a to see an animal moving in the water so um you know it ends up that that was a, a pretty easy fix once i got on the scent of the the problem oh, we're probably going to skip over a, a fair bit of the story you know the us part by asking this question, but when, when did you move back to Australia and how did you kind of start to get involved in the Australian ecosystem as it was kind of evolving? Yeah, I came back in 2008 and had pretty much uh, the company was running by itself by then and I'd gradually learned how dispensable I was as a manager, as as management. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, the more I tried to... Um, find myself a job with Craig, who was the CEO. He start, we started out as co-CEOs, then I became the CTO, then I became chief scientist, and then I did 10 patents for the company. And then after that, I thought, I love doing this. This is my real fun. The real fun I had was the first three months at doing at Unilock. After that, being a CEO wasn't that much fun. And so he, he let me off the hook and I could come home and we had enough uh, resources that my wife could pick wherever we wanted to go. And then when the uh, court case, we won the jury verdict, which is the big notoriety of the, you know, half a billion dollars uh, court verdict, everybody assumed that I'd loaded up and everybody wanted investment and everything. <laughs> but I started getting in, invited to uh, speak at Tech 23 and places like that just to tell the story. Because uh, it is inspiring for people, especially in the very early stages when they're thinking about whether they just do the the whole, you know, go as fast as you can thing and forget about intellectual property as against, you know, doing it properly and their cost and the, the rigmarole of doing patents. By in, getting involved with that group, I realised looking out at those faces at Tech23 and at Sid Start and at fish burners, uh, you know, all of the promise and all the hope they're there that I shouldn't just uh, take that for granted. And then there was two Australian stories, which were totally unexpected, was the amount of enthusiasm for those for those episodes. Like um, Jack Brabham's story was the week before mine, and I thought, wow, Jack Brabham, you know, he's a he's a national icon, he's favourite son, and uh, my thing came up and it just, it was 2 million pe people watched it in the first week. And I just thought that's really ridiculous. And it's not just the headline because I'd been in the front cover of the Sydney Morning Herald being, you know, with the wind from Microsoft. Um, so, you know, that's always a draw card. People love to see big money. But um, the story was about being an inventor and about, being a normal Australian, having a go. And uh, it just really, I had thousands of people sending support and talking about how their uncle or, you know, their son or dad called each other and started talking about their garage projects and how, you know, it was kind of inspiring to see a normal bloke have a go at something like that. And so I sat after that all of that, you know, interest. And I thought, you know, two million Australians had spent three quarters of an hour, you know, listening to me, to my story and my wife and my story and the story of Unilock. And I'm thinking, how do you repay that? So I started, um, you know, doing Friday uh, morning uh, inventor, inventor mornings where I talk to inventors for, uh, you know, 20 minutes to an hour and they just, they just turn up at a local restaurant where word got around that I was and people just turn up and 
it, people would sit there in a line waiting for me to talk to them and it, it just got out of hand and I realised that I had to get off my backside and go out and give back to uh, all of this support and interest. And also things like that are not just, um, you know, something that happened to me. It's something that's uh, really important for people who are really doing a gutsy thing, which is, you know, trying to solve a problem. It's not just all business people and trying to go IPO. It's people genuinely trying to solve a problem and spending a, a big part of their life giving up some of the things that should be, you know, given to playing soccer on the weekend. No, they're tinkering and stuff, time that they should be spending with their family. No, they're tinkering, trying to get something going. And you've got to respect that, you know. Do you have any thoughts about where we are today, or the ecosystem, like where we can maybe improve or things that you'd like to see happen? Well, I just love all of the uh, enthusiasm I see in all of the co-working spaces and the accelerators and the incubators. I am very conscious of the fact that a lot of problem solvers are really not business people. And a lot of entrepreneurs are so enthusiastic, but they're more interested in the problem than the business. And so I learned back in 2003 what it's like to have a serious business partner. And ever since that time, I've always had business partners. And so I have this, uh, this uh, illustration that I share with anybody who I meet who I know isn't strong in the business front to to realize that there's there's only three types of people in business there's bush turkeys free range chooks and battery hens and uh bush turkeys are really interesting but if you sat down to a nice cafe and they said that the egg was a bush turkey egg um you know there's a big question mark over it and that's what it's like for an investor to sit with you if you are half baked as a as a business person um, and free range chooks they know how to do beautiful eggs and everybody knows the value and the top of the range and you know there's very low risk that the thing's not going to be a success so i always partner with free range chooks battery hens they know how to produce eggs but they need so much infrastructure they they're really like government and enterprise people who don't know how to to do the egg thing without all of that infrastructure. So most of the people that I know who get into accelerators and to uh, co-working spaces, sometimes they are free range chooks, but a lot of the time they are bush turkeys and they really do need to um, partner up with the business, with the right business partner. So, you know, I always have a business co-founder um, and the, the other thing is that um, I've actually been working on a project. It's a bit early to kind of go super public about it. But one of the wonderful things that uh, some volunteers and myself have discovered is the R&D tax incentive, right? And that there's a twist to it in that the tax incentive is 43% of whatever you spend in R&D, right? And if you're in the very early stages of a business, like pre-commercialization, then everything's R&D, right? Unless, you're, unless it's a purely social initiative. If, it's, if there's any technology in it, if there's any, you know, um, high-tech applications, then it's totally R&D. And so what we're doing is working out how to uh, factor that funding so that you actually get at the beginning of a project rather than at the end because mm. it's a bit ridiculous to be going to the tax department to get money back after you've spent it because that's when you spent your equity. Mm. That's when you've spent all your credit cards and you're like at the bottom of the barrel. Mm. So we're working out how to, um, to bridge finance the R&D incentive, which means – if you have a good budget, you only need to find 60% of the funding. And then uh, we go from there working out how to help them get 
friends and family around and then an angel uh, angel support where they're coming in for the bare minimum that they need to do get to get funded but also to help problem solvers and that's why I'm calling them because problem solvers can be inventors or they can be entrepreneurs but also to free them of that situation where they're walking into a room with investors and they're starting to talk about an ROI is just not feasible and no one believes it anyway because if they haven't got business experience in the field that they're solving the problem for no one will believe them anyway and so uh you know and that's that's the most embarrassing thing like every time i watch um shark tank or you know one of these other shows if those people actually had a serious business person standing next to them who actually knew about the industry knew exactly how how to structure their deal what the how to prove the equity valuation you know because those those people in shark tank they're actually not uh seed investors they're really uh growth investors right and so it's unfair to put um people that are you know at the embryonic stages it's just it's just entertainment you're not actually helping in that situation you're just embarrassing them you know so i i just kind of feel that that's that's the area that we need to do a lot of help it's it's great for everybody to be in a room with other um entrepreneurs and other startups to learn together um you know how that works but to me i i do the reverse i actually look for a an experienced business person and bring them in as my business partner so i can take my idea and place it with execution that has experience and knows what they're doing but at the same time not be a enterprise execution person who doesn't know how to start something when you're you know starting from scratch because that's a pretty a pretty rare you know skill set i've really enjoyed this interview rick i love your story thanks mate no worries the last question is a question that i ask everybody it's just the advice question yeah sure you know if a if a brand new founder or inventor come to you tomorrow what one piece of advice would you give them Self-awareness, know what you're good at and what you're not good at and don't try to, don't assume. There's a big problem with inventors, especially good inventors, is that people say, wow, you've solved this problem, you can run that business. And their skill sets are completely different. So self-awareness, the ability to actually say, hey, I can't do everything and to spend as much time finding that co-founder as you did in solving the problem um that's really important if you're like me if you're a um a problem solver and you're not you don't you don't love the business side of it because you know the business side of it is details and discipline and high speed execution and cycling you know it's lots of work but people there's there's a mindset and there's a capability that's really um loves that like my most recent uh business partner is Angela Clark and she is so organized it's actually scary to see somebody she was running beemit for the big four banks it's a, a payments app and uh she did everything from the user experience right through to the marketing plan everything personally and handled quite a you know a large project and she gives me the job list for the week and then I'll vanish for 3 days and come back with a patent and she thinks oh that's incredible that you did that but I'm kind of scared of the list of things that I didn't get done <laughs> and it's just that she is a powerhouse you know staying on top of things just seeing the way everybody uh surrounds her and wants to support her means that you know she's got a good shot at actually making this thing successful and i even though i've solved a problem in the crypto space i'm not a banking person I'm, i don't understand the industry so it's unrealistic for somebody like me to do that even though the problem i've solved is pretty important for the industry so um you know that self awareness i'd say is the most important thing and and it is not a a little problem for example um i never forget uh it was a tech 23 
uh, event and uh, and Matt Barry and I were having a bit of a debate. We got up after each other and Matt was talking about telling everybody, hey, you can do this. You can be a CEO. Just get on the phone. You you know, it's not hard to find the, the CEO of Telstra's phone number and just call the guy, you know, just don't be scared. Once you do it a few times, it'll it'll be really, it'll come second nature to you. And he says, and I don't understand that. And then I got up, I got up after him and I said, how many of you would be happy to speak to the, tel- the CEO of Telstra if we could get arranged for you to talk to him next week? And one or two put their hand up and I said to Matt in front of everybody, we're not like, we're not alpha, alpha males, mate. We're not all alpha like you. You have all this confidence. We don't know what, we don't. We don't know the first thing and, and it's just to organize your mind and to get your act together under that pressure. It's just not a natural thing for most people. And so being that self-aware or finding somebody who has actually had success in that situation and they can walk into that room and make sure they don't foul it up. Like I've, I've walked into rooms with some really heavy characters and, uh, and, and fouled it up and you it's one of those things that rattle around in your brain for for years because you just think what could have happened if you had just had your act together or you're just a bit more assertive or a little bit more confident you know so and that's the reason why I'm an inventor and <laughs> not a, an entrepreneur thank you so much rick for your time no worries i really appreciate it no worries mate I hope you enjoyed that interview. More interviews are on the way. Follow the podcast wherever you're listening right now. Stay tuned for more interviews with many, many more amazing people from the Australian startup ecosystem. Thanks for listening and see you next time.